Welcome to episode 4 of the Red Book Podcast, the Tolkien podcast that aims to explore the works of Tolkien and his created legendarium in depth. In episode 3, I looked at the concept of Arda Mard and its relationship with another concept called Morgoth's Ring, and how both shaped and influenced the world itself and the developing history of Arda throughout the ages. How the presence of Morgoth still lingers long after he has been cast out from the physical world. As usual, before getting into what I'll be talking about this time, I want to let people know that this podcast is available on various platforms. Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, Stitcher. I can always be found under the name The Red Book. And this episode will appear on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the red book, which is still the best place to comment on the episode or ask any follow-up questions some of which I will respond to in my end of month comment response series I call the appendices. Finally, if you want to support me beyond subscribing to the YouTube channel or following on your podcast platform of choice, there is a Patreon with various levels and benefits found at patreon.com slash the red book. I think the best way to really start this episode is to provide you with a quote that should make things clear. Yet so great was the power of his uprising, that in ages forgotten he contended with Manwë and all the Valar, and through long years in Arda held dominion over most of the lands of the earth. But he was not alone, for of the Maiar many were drawn to his splendour in the days of his greatness, and remained in that allegiance down into his darkness, and others he corrupted afterwards to his service, with lies and treacherous gifts. Dreadful among these spirits, with the Vala Raukar, the scourges of fire that in Middle-earth were called the Balrogs, demons of terror. The Silmarillion, Vala Quenta, of the enemies. I am, of course, talking about the Balrogs. Strangely, they have been underrepresented on my channel so far. In fact, I ran a few polls to help decide the subject of this podcast episode, choosing two topics that I haven't covered enough, the Balrogs, and Fëanor, the most infamous of elves, the latter being one of my favourite figures in the Legendarium, so I can't explain why I haven't talked about him much, or even the Balrogs. Pole after pole ended in a stalemate, until the public finally sided with the servants of Morgoth. In this episode, I am going to cover the nature of the Balrogs, essentially answering the question, what are Balrogs? This may seem basic, as I'm sure anyone who has read the Silmarillion can give an answer to this. They are fallen Maiar, servants of Morgoth, demons of might, spirits of fire, and manifestations of flame and shadow. That's all well and good, but most people tend to stop there with the description. But this isn't TikTok. I'd like to go a bit further. Fallen Maiar, what does this mean? Why are they classed as a distinct group in their own right, Balrogs? Why aren't other servants of Morgoth, such as Sauron, considered Balrogs? When and why did they serve Morgoth? What does Tolkien mean when he calls them demons? What is a spirit of fire? Is this something distinguishable from being a Maya? What do we know about the form they took? I'm hoping to answer these questions and explain my thoughts and my opinions on the nature of the Balrogs. Before getting into this, I do want to point out that this will not be an exploration of how Balrogs changed over the many years Tolkien developed his legendarium. Balrogs were at one time greater creatures than orcs, but creatures closer to orcs than they were any sort of divine being. They were also at one time creatures that Morgoth himself fashioned in his great northern fortress of Atumno. Made creatures, again, not divine spirits. Explaining how Balrogs went from armies of thousands of fiercer creatures than orcs or trolls to divine beings numbering perhaps at most seven and being associated with the likes of Sauron, Melian, Eonwë and Arian is something worth focusing on without getting sidetracked. It's an entire subject on its own and there's a lot of history there to cover with Tolkien's thoughts on them from his earliest writings all the way through to the last writings before his death. Too much to cover here, but I just want to say that this is something I will dedicate time to later in my archive series. For the purposes of this episode, I will be discussing Balrogs as we know them from the Lord of the Rings, 
and the published Silmarillion, as well as the post-Lord of the Rings writings found in various History of Middle-earth volumes. As what I quoted from the Silmarillion says, the Balrogs were Maiar. This means they are of the same order as Sauron and other recognisable figures that were later known as Gandalf and Saruman, for example. All these spirits and countless others are called the Maiar, the singular being Maya. As I have explained in other episodes of this podcast, these spirits descended into Arda itself to help the Valar shape the world. The Valar becoming known as the powers of Arda. With both the Valar and the Maiar belonging to the race known as the Ainur. The number of the Valar is known, and each member of that order can be named, but the number of the Maiar cannot be told. But all are the divine spirits created from the thought of Eru, the single omnipotent creator existing outside the boundaries of the physical universe, the timeless halls. The Ainulindale chapter of the Silmarillion, or the music of the Ainur, tells us the following. There was Eru, the one, who in Arda is called Iluvatar, and he made first the Ainur, the holy ones, that were the offspring of his thought, and they were with him before aught else was made, and he spoke to them, propounding to them themes of music, and they sang before him, and he was glad. But for a long while they sang only each alone, or but a few together, while the rest hearkened, for each comprehended only that part of the mind of Iluvatar from which he came, and in the understanding of their brethren they grew but slowly. Yet ever as they listened, they came to a deeper understanding and increased in unison and harmony. This is the beginning of the music of the Ainur, from which the designs and inspiration of the Ainur melded with the theme of Eru, leading to Eru using all that was placed in the music as the basis for the created world itself, including the discord of Melkor. As Melkor attempted to create his own theme, Eru would incorporate it and begin a new theme, until ending the music itself of his own accord. But what we are told during Melkor's discord is that he wove his thoughts into the music. And as discord grew, many grew despondent. Their thought was disturbed and their music faltered. But some began to attune their music to his, rather than to the thought which they had at first. These spirits had attuned themselves to Melkor in the music and never abandoned him. The same chapter tells us, And it seemed at last that there were two musics progressing at one time before the seat of Luvatar, and they were utterly at variance. The one was deep and wide and beautiful, but slow and blended with an immeasurable sorrow from which its beauty chiefly came. The other had now achieved a unity of its own, but it was loud and vain and endlessly repeated, and it had little harmony but rather a clamorous unison as of many trumpets braying upon a few notes, and it essayed to drown the other music by the violence of its voice. Melkor was not alone in his discord. Spirits had joined him, aligned themselves with his greatness, and as the text says, Melkor's music had achieved a unity of its own. There was no variance. All were performing as a clamorous unison, trumpets braying upon a few notes. I'm not saying only those spirits who became the Balrogs made up this group, but I am confident in saying that every spirit that became known as a Balrog was a part of this group. Individuality, creativity, a desire for harmony with others had been abandoned. They were Melkors, braying on the same notes as he was, over and over again, essentially becoming the Maiar of Melkor, lining up with what Tolkien tells us in Of the Enemies where spirits were drawn to Melkor's greatness and remained in his allegiance down into his darkness. They had become his servants before even Arda was made. What he desired, what he sought for, became what they would aim to achieve for him. If the Maiar are the servants of the Valar, these corrupted spirits could quite easily be described at this point as slaves to the will of the Valar Melkor his splendour and greatness being so vast and monumental in scale, they were moths drawn to the flame. This is all but confirmed to us in the history of Middle-earth. First, the Ainulindale section of Morgoth's Ring, volume 10 of the history of Middle-earth, tells us that when Melkor descended into Arda after it was made, he was alone without friend or companion, and had at that time a small following. 
for even those who attuned themselves to his music had not all been willing to follow him into the world. Few that had come were able to endure his servitude, but these were the Elar, spirits who first adhered to him in the days of his splendour and became most like him in his corruption. Their hearts were of fire, but they were cloaked in darkness and terror went before them. They had whips of flame, Balrogs they were named by the Noldor in later days. The History of Middle-earth, Volume 10, Morgoth's Ring, the later Quenta Silmarillion, the first phase commentary. For those unaware, Eilar is a word in the language Quenya, referring not only to Balrogs, but beings who did not require a body in order to be what we would call whole, unlike beings such as the Elves, who existed naturally in a state of union between the body and the spirit. The Valar and the Maiar do not require physical bodies, but some chose to in order to interact with the physical world, for various reasons. But this quote more than hints at this dedicated servitude of the Balrogs to Morgoth. Even other spirits who attuned themselves to him did not all follow him to Arda, and some who did were not even able to endure his servitude. It seems that the Balrogs could endure it, and their servitude seems to be absolute. We are told in an altered version of this quote in the published Silmarillion that in Etumno, Melkor gathered his demons about him, those spirits who first adhered to him in the days of his splendour and became most like him in his corruption. Balrogs they were named in Middle-earth in later days. The Silmarillion Chapter 3 Of the Coming of Elves and the Captivity of Melkor when Melkor was taken in that war by the Valar, the Balrogs were not. Yet, Chapter 9 of the Flight of the Noldor tells us that while Melkor was held in captivity in the west, they lurked still. The Valar in their haste had not descended into the lower vaults in their assault on Melkor, and the Balrogs awaited ever the return of their lord. Until, in a tempest of fire, they ascended to assault the spider creature Ungoliant when she had Melkor in her grasp following the destruction of the two trees of Valinor and the theft of the Silmarils. This places the Balrogs in quite a distinguished and recognisable group. They aren't spirits or creatures who later found themselves joining Morgoth or being corrupted by him, serving others and deciding to switch allegiance for their own benefit. They were there from the start. In the music of the Einar, the idea of individuals attuning themselves to others would see those spirits we count as the Maiar of Aule, the Maiar of Ulmo, etc., being spirits sharing in similar gifts, being drawn to the greater spirit. Sauron joining with Aule because they had a similar nature, similar desires and gifts. Eonwe joining Manwe for the same reasons. These Balrogs joined Melkor. They are the Maiar of Melkor, setting them apart from those who came later, such as Sauron. This leads me into answering a question I have been personally asked, and one I have seen pop up on various sites over the years. What makes Balrogs different from Sauron? Why isn't he a Balrog? I hope I have maybe answered why already through the method of corruption, the nature of the spirits, and the time it took place. But I want to be clear and say that not every Maya who joined with Melkor or served him did so for the same reasons or at the same time. Sauron was never a Balrog, as Balrogs are by definition a very specific group that had been drawn to Melkor at a point in time, all of them sharing in a similar nature. Sauron differs in that he had a different nature and served another for a time, Aule, learning much under his tutelage and then being drawn to Melkor for other reasons. It's like asking why Ossi wasn't a Balrog, one who for a time betrayed his master Ulmo and served Melkor. These were spirits who attuned themselves to others and were drawn to Melkor through a different kind of corruption, the promise of gifts, treacherous or no. Sauron was drawn to Melkor due to what he could achieve under him, the power he would be gifted, the authority, being able to achieve his own designs swiftly at the expense of others, 
with the mightiest of the Valar blessing him with the power to do so. Sauron's nature was well established at this time, and he took all that he had learned so far under another, and his allegiance changed. The shape of the Balrogs, their personalities, the manifestations of their will were all shaped by the descent of Melkor into darkness and corruption. They followed him from the start, they fell with him, and the will within became physically apparent for all to see in the world. As Tolkien says, their hearts were afire, but they were cloaked in darkness, and terror went before them. They had whips of flame. The History of Middle-earth, Volume 10, Morgoth's Ring, the later Quenta Silmarillion, the first phase. But this might be easier to answer by explaining their nature as spirits of fire. As I've already said, the Einar, the Valar and the Maiar are not all equal, nor are they the same in their nature. To me, calling Balrogs spirits of fire is like calling the spirits who served the Lord of Waters, Ulmo, spirits of water, the lakes of Ose, Uinen and maybe even Salmar. Spirits who, in their nature, are attuned to an aspect of creation, leading them to be drawn to the greatest spirit who would imagine such an aspect becoming part of creation. No Ainu would know more of the sea and the waters than Ulmo, being responsible for them and then holding authority over them. Why wouldn't these lesser spirits be drawn to him and help him in the music and then in the physical world after Eru made it so, themselves being spirits of it? spirits of water in their very nature. We can then compare Balrogs, corrupted spirits of fire, to a being like Arian. The maiden whom the Valar chose from among the Maiar to guide the vessel of the sun was named Arian, and he that steered the island of the moon was Tilion. In the days of the trees, Arian had tended the golden flowers in the gardens of Vanna, and watered them with the bright dews of Laurelin. But Tilion was a hunter of the company of Orme, and he had a silver bow. Arian the maiden was mightier than he, and she was chosen because she had not feared the heats of Laurelin and was unhurt by them. Being from the beginning a spirit of fire, whom Melkor had not deceived nor drawn to his service, too bright were the eyes of Arian for even the Eldar to look on, and leaving Valinor she forsook the form and raiment which like the Valar she had worn there, and she was as a naked flame, terrible in the fullness of her splendour. The Silmarillion Chapter 11 Of the Sun and Moon and the Hiding of Valinor As we are told here, Arian is herself a spirit of fire, but one Melkor could not corrupt and draw to his service. I'd go as far as to say that Arian would have been a Balrog had Melkor been successful in his attempts to draw her to his service. Arian also showing that not all spirits of fire became Balrogs, but that they held great power. She abandoned the raiment she had worn, which hid the fullness of her splendour except for her eyes. She became a naked flame, terrible in her splendour, leading us to imagine how terrible Balrogs would be to look upon, explaining the fear they strike in the hearts of Melkor's enemies, manifestations of fire blended with the shadow and darkness of their corruption. A red fire, a black shadow, a form made to perform violence and spread terror in the name of their master. It also explains Melkor's affinity for fire, which would stretch to undying fires beneath the earth, later used by a certain Dark Lord forging a little object called the One Ring. Before wrapping up, I want to explain another term that Tolkien uses often for the Balrogs, demon. Even the name Balrog is really the name Valarauko, a name in Quenya meaning demon of might or demon of power. This is a term Tolkien used from the earliest conception of the Balrogs to the very last before he stopped writing, gathering his demons, dwelling in a tumno where he wrought his demons, the elves calling them the Balrogath, chief of the demons serving Morgoth. What did Tolkien mean by this word? Our modern interpretation of the word demon seems to have people imagining some hellish figure with horns, sharp teeth and claws. In fact, the most popular adaptation of Tolkien's works, the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movie trilogy from the early 2000s, has Durin's Bane, the most famous of all Tolkien's Balrogs, appear in what I can only describe as a demonic form. It looks how I'd imagine a demon. 
And while I don't want to talk about that interpretation of the form of the Balrog, I want to talk about the term itself, and how it doesn't really refer to appearance. Here is a quote from letter 181 to Michael Strait, dated around January or February 1956. Gandalf is a created person, though possibly a spirit that existed before in the physical world. His function as a wizard is an angelos or messenger from the Valar or rulers to assist the rational creatures of Middle-earth to resist Sauron, a power too great for them unaided. Angelos is the Greek word that we translate into angel and means one who brings a message or messenger. This makes sense as the Istari are representatives of the powers of the West. They are emissaries, messengers, there to aid Sauron's enemies against him. When I use the word angel, do we imagine Gandalf as a figure with a halo and feathered wings? No, he is a messenger of God, or even the lowercase g-gods in Valinor. Gandalf is said in letter 156 to Robert Murray from November 1954, is able to act in emergency as an angel, no more violently than the release of St. Peter from prison. For those who don't get this reference, the liberation of St. Peter saw an angel appear to Peter in prison, telling him to leave. His chains fell off. Peter followed the angel and the prison doors opened, Peter then being led into the city. The use of the word demon therefore is less about how a Balrog looks, but more about what it is, what it represents. It's of the same order as beings we can later describe as angels for their role, but it is a servant not of God or gods, but of the fallen one, Melkor, spirits of evil who serve evil, incarnated in a terrible form, the demons of Morgoth. Meaning we can probably use the term demon for other non-Balrog figures, even Sauron. Sauron's natural state following his fall to evil is said to be a demon form, his spirit state being demon form as Tolkien says in Morgoth's Ring, Myths Transformed. I take this to mean that demon is a word used to describe fallen, corrupted or evil spirits of divine origin. It also means that if we take the confrontation between Gandalf and Durin's Bane on the bridge of Khazad Dûm in The Lord of the Rings, it is a confrontation between a wizard and a Balrog. Take this further, and it is a confrontation between a servant of the secret fire, of all that is good, against a servant of the dark fire, the progenitor of evil. We can then take this even further and say it is essentially a confrontation between an angel and a demon. That's it for this episode. I hope I have answered some common questions about Balrogs, maybe even opened up the secrets of their mysterious nature even a little. I find conversations of this nature to be just a bit more interesting than endless talk of Balrog wings, though I will definitely fall into the trap and discuss that at a later date. There's plenty more to say about these fallen Maiar, the most loyal and destructive of Morgoth's servants. I hope you enjoyed it and I want to thank those who continue to support my Redbook project on Patreon and on YouTube. Again, if you have any questions, feedback, discussion points, please comment on Patreon, YouTube or Discord. They are the best places to get in touch. I hope you will return for the next chapter of the Red Book. Thank you.